I want you to hit me as hard as you can. In the 35 years since it first stomped onto screens, Paul Verhoeven's Robocop has only grown stronger as a prescient commentary on over-militarized police, corporate greed, the decaying American manufacturing industry, the rise of violent street crime, the bombardment of bad news delivered by chipper anchors, and the continued decline of the city of Detroit, Michigan. But aside from all the foreshadowing and subtext, the real question is how a brash and temperamental Dutch filmmaker like Paul Verhoeven could make only his second English language film in a genre he was inexperienced with and do it with a limited budget and still overcome a series of production challenges to deliver a rousing sci-fi action masterpiece. Get your chrome polish and find out what the fuck happened to this movie. In the futuristic Detroit of 1991, beat cop Alex Murphy is killed in the line of duty by a barbaric gang of criminals. Under the nefarious Omni-Consumer products, Murphy is revived as a half-man, half-machine, and directed to rid the decaying metropolis of law-breaking scumbags using extreme force. The more Murphy massacres miscreants, the longer he clings to a dwindling shred of humanity beneath his steely visage. The inception of Robocop began in the early 1980s, when junior story executive and aspiring screenwriter Ed Neumeier was working on the set of Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. Neumeier was already fascinated by robots and mature comics, and he had a vision of what he called a Blade Runner-type world with an all-mechanical cop coming to a sense of real human intelligence. He would merge that with another concept he had of competing business executives literally killing each other, and the idea for his script was born. After quickly penning a 40-page outline, Neumeier found a writing partner named Michael Miner after seeing one of his video submissions to Universal. Together, they toiled over the screenplay for two months in their spare time. Neumeier was also inspired by Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho in how the main character is killed in the first reel. He also made a conscious effort to include scathing satire about the kind of corporate malfeasance he had previously experienced himself. Miner labeled the story comic relief for a cynical time where the confluence of Reaganomics, corporate avarice, and spiking crime rates created a deeply pessimistic period in America. Orion Pictures producer John Davison became interested in the script, then titled Robocop, The Future of Law Enforcement. Davison showed the writers movies like Dirty Harry and Mad Max 2, The Road Warrior, as examples of the satirical tone he wanted, which was then incorporated into rewrites. Director Jonathan Kaplan was attached, but he exited to make the Matthew Broderick chimp drama Project X. Finding a replacement proved difficult, and many big-name directors immediately passed based only on what was considered a silly title. David Cronenberg, Repo Man director Alex Cox, and Monty Hellman also turned it down, although Hellman would actually stick around as second unit director to handle many crucial scenes himself. Orion executive Barbara Boyle suggested edgy Dutch filmmaker Paul Verhoeven, despite having made his American studio debut on Orion's own medieval flop, Flesh and Blood. But when Verhoeven first read the screenplay, he reportedly dismissed it after just a few pages. It was his wife Martine who convinced him of the script's weighty themes and satirical point of view. Verhoeven requested a new draft with a more serious tone and a sex scene with Murphy and Lewis, but he ultimately realized the previous draft was superior. The casting of Alex Murphy took several months, with Arnold Schwarzenegger heavily considered for the role. Orion had just made The Terminator and wanted to replicate that success with Robocop. But Arnie's hulking frame was considered just too big for the Robocop suit. It would take another couple of years before the star and director collaborated on a different hyper-violent sci-fi blockbuster. Other actors considered for Murphy included Sylvester Stallone, Rutger Hauer, Michael Ironside, Tom Berenger, James Remar, Keith Carradine, and Peter Fonda. But the slender and affordable Peter Weller emerged as a frontrunner, not only due to an impeccable chin, but also his training as a marathon runner and martial artist. To prepare for the physically demanding role, Weller spent months training with movement coach Moni Yakim to develop a distinct gait, practicing in an American football uniform to simulate the robo suit, which was still under construction. More on that in a bit. For Murphy's capable partner, Lewis, Stephanie Zimbalist of TV's Remington Steel was chosen, but couldn't work out the schedule, leading to Nancy Allen getting the role. Other key characters would be played by Ronnie Cox, Miguel Ferrar, 
and Kurtwood Smith as unforgettable felon Clarence Boddicker. Bitches leave. With a budget of nearly $11 million, Robocop began principal photography in August 1986. Despite its Detroit setting, almost all of the film was shot in Dallas, Texas, when it was determined it had a more futuristic skyline, assisted by the occasional matte painting, and an advanced metropolitan layout that Verhoeven was looking for. He also wanted an aesthetic similar to Blade Runner and requested its production designer, Lawrence G. Paul. But the limited budget prioritized the need for a great Robocop suit instead of advanced visual effects. Verhoeven recruited his Soldier of Orange director of photography, Joost Vacano, to shoot the movie. The first big production problem was that the cumbersome Robo outfit was not even completed when filming commenced. Davison had hired effects whiz Rob Bottin, whose incredible work appeared in The Thing and The Howling, to design and build the Robocop costume. But in their initial meetings, Verhoeven allegedly had no qualms about telling Bottin his sketches were garbage, which would be an early indicator of their inevitable working relationship. Inspired by C-3PO, Metropolis, and The Day the Earth Stood Still, Bottin and artist Miles Tevis went through dozens of concepts and could not find a style everyone agreed on until they ultimately dialed in to the sleek robots of Japanese artist Soriyama. However, with all the constant indecision over the design, it would take months for Botin and his crew to actually fabricate the final Robocop suits. The specs were ambitious and unprecedented, not to mention expensive. Blending various materials including foam latex, aluminum, and fiberglass, the outfits cost nearly $1 million, with versions weighing up to 80 pounds and Botin worked at his own pace, which only further provoked his notoriously impatient director. Principal photography had to conform to its brief production window, and with no shiny man-machine of justice to film, Verhoeven scrambled to shoot whatever he could that didn't require his leading cyborg, like the corporate restroom confrontation and the Benny Hill-inspired TV show. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. <laughs> when the costume finally did make it to the set, it took nearly half a day just to get Weller into the outfit, the late arrival of the suit also meant that Weller would not have the month of costume rehearsal he expected. The suit's reflective metallic surface tormented cinematographer Yost Vacano, who eventually decided to light the hero like he was an automobile. But the physical demands of the costume would be the bane of Peter Weller's existence. The suits were extremely hard to maneuver in, and the chunky rubber hands turned a simple action like catching car keys into a chore that necessitated dozens of takes. The sheer weight of the suit in 95-degree Texas weather led to the actor losing as much as three pounds a day through perspiration. Parts of the outfit were continually prodding him in unpleasant ways. The low visibility of the mask made it nearly impossible for Weller to interact with his environment. And the stress of the claustrophobic costume led to insomnia and a dependence on prescription meds. Weller's dedicated method approach only contributed to the challenges, as he insisted on staying in character between takes and having everyone on set refer to him only as Robo or Murphy. Rob Bottin purposely continued to call him Peter just to get under his skin, which only further incensed the actor. And after all of Weller's meticulous movement training, once he was in the suit and cameras were rolling, Verhoeven was completely unsatisfied. His Robocop looked more like a samurai ballerina than an unstoppable armored lawman. This necessitated a complete readjustment to how Weller moved in the outfit, further taxing his strained relationship with the filmmaker, which was then made even worse by the actor deciding he wanted to improvise new elaborate versions of his prime directives. Tensions continued to flare until the situation became so volatile that Orion head Mike Metavoy threatened to replace his leading man in the middle of the shoot. Weller still refused to back down, and was essentially dismissed from the production. Lance Henriksen and stuntman Gary Combs were seriously considered as replacements. But with a costly suit that was literally tailor-made for Weller's physique, eventually the actor and director agreed to call a truce long enough to complete filming. But Verhoeven's paranoia and explosive disposition persisted, and when he raged about every inconvenience, second unit director Monty Hellman would deal with the actors himself. The ongoing personality clash between Verhoeven and Rob Bottin over the title character's appearance came to a head, so to speak, when filming the scene where Robocop removes his helmet. Bottin thought it should be shrouded in darkness to create suspense, while Verhoeven wanted Murphy's freaky cybernetic skull on full display. When the director ultimately got his way, Bottin refused to speak to Verhoeven for the remainder of the filming process. Of course, by the time the film premiered, the two men had reconciled and eagerly reteamed for Total Recall which earned Botine an Academy Award. 
Verhoeven's constant bellowing refrains of more and bigger would unsurprisingly lead to some of the movie's most memorably extreme moments. One prime example is the boardroom scene with Ed 209, a terrifying machine monstrosity designed by visual effects expert Phil Tippett to resemble a hybrid of killer whale and corsair jet. The glitching robot's vicious execution of an OCP exec was initially done with dozens of squibs, but the result was still not grisly enough for Verhoeven. So the scene was reshot with 200 squibs and a trash bag filled with spaghetti squash and fake blood, resulting in so much carnage it had to be trimmed to avoid an X rating from the MPAA. Another scene that was perhaps bigger than even Verhoeven expected was the explosion of the gas station. The blast was so substantial that it shattered windows for several blocks of the surrounding downtown area, and unaware locals, along with the Dallas Fire Department, thought an actual fuel station had blown up. The detonation was significant enough to prompt Texas law changes for production protocols. Leaving Texas behind, filming headed to Pittsburgh for scenes set at the old factory where yet another jaw-droppingly gruesome death would take place when Paul McCrane's mutated henchman, Emil, gets splattered, a deliberate homage to the 1977 movie The Incredible Melting Man, which Botin had worked on as a teenager. As you might imagine, the disgusting burst of toxic entrails was too much for the MPAA, who suggested the entire sequence be removed. But when test audiences later revealed it was their favorite scene in the movie, the filmmakers insisted on its inclusion, and the MPAA ultimately relented. As a result of all the production's delays and difficulties, like so many of the characters on screen, the budget was also bleeding profusely. The movie was over schedule and over budget, but Orion felt comfortable enough with the completed footage to extend the shoot and add another few million in resources. It also turned out that the original budget agreement was somehow never signed, a serious clerical oversight and legal concern that further urged the studio to kick in more cash. Of course, it still wasn't enough for Verhoeven, who really wanted $20 million, but he made the best with what he had. After three grueling months, Filming wrapped up in California with perhaps the most unsettling scene in the movie, the disturbingly gory dismantling of Murphy by the guns of Boddicker's gang. The horrifying practical effect was achieved with prosthetic limbs and a full latex model of Weller's head for the final bullet, a morbid moment that turned the previously enthusiastic cast and crew completely quiet. As Neumeyer succinctly stated, it was a grim set. Verhoeven has often described Robocop as a futuristic Jesus, and likens Murphy's death to the crucifixion in that it helps foster heartfelt sympathy for the character early on. That brutal scene proved overwhelming for audiences, prompting walkouts when an early cut was shown in test screenings. And in the days before the existence of NC-17, the MPAA fully intended to slap the movie with an X rating, which started a whole new round of drama with the reluctant Verhoeven, who was nonetheless contractually obligated to deliver an R-rated movie. After several different cuts were submitted, ultimately it came down to snipping a matter of seconds from the more revolting segments to get the R. Ironically, the restored edition with all the original bloodshed is the version of the movie now most commonly available. Orion would also struggle with marketing for Robocop, which was a very adult movie with a title that could be considered goofy at best. Defying convention at the time, the studio showed an early cut to critics familiar with Verhoeven's acclaimed Dutch filmography in the hopes of getting advance reviews in major newspapers to set the tone and audience expectations ahead of time. The tactic helped, and when Robocop hit theaters on July 17, 1987, it opened in first place, ahead of Jaws 4 The Revenge and Disney's reissue of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. The positive critical reaction and public word of mouth made Robocop a summer sleeper hit, eventually amassing $53.4 million at the domestic box office on a final cost of nearly $14 million. Of course, a whole other video could be done exploring the lasting legacy of Robocop, from public perception and critical adoration to the considerable influence it's had on other movies and talented filmmakers since. The troubled production with the absurd title would launch a mega-popular franchise that includes two cinematic sequels, a reboot, animated and live-action TV series, games, comics, and billion-dollar merchandising that has included everything from action figures to watches to bubble bath. Sadly, the movie would also anticipate the bleak fate of Detroit, which indeed filed for bankruptcy in 2013. But at least what's left of the city would finally get its very own statue of Robocop. Paul Verhoeven would continue applying his distinct vision, satirical sensibilities, and provocative nature in memorable ways. 
and after 35 years, Robocop's thematic warnings and rebuke of corporate greed give the movie a resonance that reverberates even louder and further than its technical achievements. Even after the production's logistical nightmares, ego clashes, and various complications, the shiny pop culture icon at the center only continues to grow in popularity. Your move, creep. Let us know your thoughts. Leave a comment in the comments. And thanks for watching.